Hey guys, it's Navin out on No Limit Hold'em with uh, part two of my question and answer series. If you remember from the first part, I asked a bunch of uh, students to give me a question and I was going to make a video on just each of those questions or on all three of the questions. I got four questions and they all kind of go together, so I decided to merge them together in one cohesive video. Uh, but it went an hour and ten minutes or something like that. So I chopped it up into three segments and you're on section two. I hope you enjoyed the first part and I hope you like this part even better. I'm going to jump right in exactly where we left off before. Uh, so don't be surprised if there's a little bit of a, a skip in the audio. Um, but eh, it's not too bad. I broke it in a, in a place where it seemed to kind of make sense. So hope you enjoy. Um, here we are with part two. just kind of getting uh, just kind of getting started right um, so understanding the way ranges interact with flop textures that's what this is all going to be about it's going to be um, the central bit of information that's going to tell you uh, when to donk lead when to see bat when to raise uh, our monster hands uh, you know for for value and when to balance that out by having bluffs and uh, how to size uh, those bats, how to size the bats, and really how to size the raises also. Um, so establishing who has range advantage uh, tells you who really ought to take the lead. And in GTO terms, uh, there are two ways to look, two main ways to look at range advantage. You can look at who has the nut advantage and who has the most frequent strength. Um, and these things are what's going to tell you who has incentive to bet. Uh, the player that has the most frequent strength generally is going to have the most incentive to make a continuation bet on the flop, and the player who has the more nut value in his range, and these aren't always going to be the same player, but sometimes it will. Um, but when one player has more uh, nutted value in their range, but the other player has more frequent strength, uh, the really what this is going to come down to is uh, when the stacks are very shallow and or you're playing in a three bat pot, so basically when there's a lower stack to pot ratio, frequent strength is going to get the nod in terms of who has incentive to bat, who has kind of that initiative. Um, and when stacks are deeper, and especially with deep stacks in a single raise pot, so when the stack to pot ratio is very high, uh, the player that has the nut advantage is going to have the most incentive to get very aggressive. Um, so it's really about how many bets and raises can go into a pot before the players are all in. It's going to determine whether nut advantage or frequent strength flopping is going to be kind of the most central reason to make a bet or to take the initiative. Um, but keep in mind, this won't be important if your opponents are just always going to check to the razor. And it won't be important if uh, you can count on your opponents to make continuation bets if you check to them and they're the raiser. Um, in that case, of course, it's just the player that put in the last bet on the last street is going to be the player that is going to have incentive to bet, or at least think he does. Um, so in reality, or in game theory terms, it comes down to nut advantage and frequent strength, mainly. Um, and... Uh, depth, stack depths, uh, but in reality, generally, in-game in most of your low stakes and micro stakes and you know, maybe as high as 2.5 or a little higher uh, at the local casino, um, these are the things that are going to matter. Definitely in the high stakes, these are the things that are going to matter. Generally in the low stakes or online at low stakes and micro stakes, um, the the most uh, common thing is that players that called pre-flop are going to check to the raiser and the person that made the raise pre-flop is going to have a highly exploitable c-bat percent. They're going to c-bat way too often and if you know that your opponent's going to c-bat way too often, you shouldn't stop them from doing that by leading into them. So very generally, um, check to the raiser you know, in smaller stakes games. But when you're playing against good players, and especially if they probably respect you as such, that's when these things are really going to help you determine who has the initiative. Um, so initiative isn't just who put the last raise in on the previous street. 
there is no such thing as initiative in game theory optimal terms. If you're going to look at initiative as just whoever made the last aggressive action on the last street, um, the reason that the player who made the last aggressive action tends to be the player that has incentive to bat and therefore is going to have the quote initiative or may as well have the effective initiative is because the player that puts the last raise in is representing the more polarized distribution. So on more flops, really most flops, the more polarized distribution is going to lead to having the most hands that want to bet either for value or as a bluff by way of making more uh, very strong hands and more air. Um, so there are, but there are in reality some boards that are good for the callers range and some boards that tend to be good for pre-flop raisers range. Very generally, boards that interact with a lot of starting hands are going to be better for the caller because we've kind of already established in the pre-flop action that the player who put the last raise in is uncapped and can have hands like pocket aces, pocket kings, etc. Uh, whereas the player that did the pre-flop calling, um, he does have less nutted value pre-flop. He's got you know a very capped range, or his range is capped to some degree. He's not likely to have aces. He's not likely to have kings, ace, king, pocket queens. Um, and he's also unlikely to have any kind of bluffing type hand, right? Because he called, he didn't raise. So the preflop caller is going to have a bound and capped range, and the preflop raiser will be uh, unbound, or well, uncapped and less bound. So the preflop raiser will have tend to have a more polarized distribution and a wider range. So by way of having a wider range, you're going to have boards that hit more. Uh, and, well, miss more flops, uh, but make more uh, strong hands. Uh, for instance, if you have pocket aces, pocket kings, and pocket queens in your range, and the flop comes out queen high, uh, you can have top set or an over pair. Whereas if the flop comes out queen high in your pre-flop caller, you probably can't have top set or an over pair. Just as an example. Um, so boards that have a lot of middling cards are going to tend to be better for the caller uh, because even if the raiser can have all of those middle strength hands depending on where he raised from and if you're playing heads up or a uh, full ring um, but if he opens the button he can probably have all those same suited connectors that the big blind can have but he'll have a lower concentration of them uh, because he'll have hands like ace king he'll have hands like you know ace queen offsuit he'll have hands like uh, uh, maybe whatever bluffs he's using or light opens, but the preflop caller isn't going to have those hands, so he's going to have a higher concentration of suited cards, connected cards, and middling cards. So when the boards come out and they've got a lot of middle cards, uh, the preflop caller is going to hit that uh, with a higher concentration of the hands within his range than the preflop raiser. Uh, the preflop raiser is going to have an advantage or really just more incentive to bet. Uh, boards with one or two Broadway cards and then one, two, or three small cards. Um, your Queen 7 Deuce or your Ace 2 2, those are like the, or King 8 4 Rainbow are the quintessential uh, check to the preflop raiser, and preflop raiser is going to bet their range, their entire range sometimes, uh, type boards. Um, now, boards that have some texture, you know, wet boards, volatile boards, oftentimes are better for the caller. Um, dry boards are often, but not always, uh, going to be better for pre-flop pre raiser. As a very general rule of thumb, static boards favor pre-flop raiser, uh, and volatile and wet boards are going to favor pre-flop caller. Um, yeah, so when we're looking at incentive to aggress, it's not only about who's got the stronger range, it's really about who's got most reason to bet, and reasons to bet come primarily in two flavors. Uh, generally, we're going to be doing something that is akin to value betting, although if you've watched many of my videos, you know I don't think strictly in these terms. Um, we're going to be, you know, we could say value betting or bluffing would be our primary incentives. 
Uh, I think a better way to look at it is the incentives to aggress are typically going to be our hand is a favorite to win even when we bet and get called, and that means win at showdown or by showdown. Uh, and the other reason to bet is that we have a lot to be gained by getting our opponent to surrender their equity. That can look like protection, it can look like a bluff, but really what it is is, just as I said, your hand isn't very strong, and so you've got a lot to be gained by getting your opponent to let go of whatever hand they're holding, right? That's where your incentive to aggress comes from. Uh, the more value hands and the more air, or the more polarized your overall distribution is, and the, the more middle strength hands and draws um, and bluff catchers, showdown value type stuff that your opponent has in their range, uh, again, the more incentive you have to aggress and the less incentive they have to aggress. That's kind of how you determine when the flop comes out who's going to be playing offense and who's going to be playing defense given the, uh, the board texture. So, you know, if we consider these examples, ace, nine, four, rainbow. So, you know, preflop razor will often have uh, the frequent strength and the nut advantage on this board, but he's also going to miss completely pretty well. And so he's going to have plenty of incentive to make a bet. Now, if we look at either of the next two flops, 3-3-3 three, 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 or 8-4-2 rainbow, probably neither player hits that board very often. Uh, so in a way, the situation is kind of similar to the way it was before the flop came out, where the player that uh, put in the last raise preflop still has the uh, most uh, strong hands and bluffs, and, well, I should say the more, uh, the most very strong hands and the most bluffs. And the player that uh, called preflop has uh, a more merged, tighter, more narrowly defined middle strength range. He's not going to have the bluffs and he's not going to have the you know, pocket aces, kings, queens, and jacks in most situations. Um, and so on either of these flops in the middle here, we're going to find that preflop razor has the most incentive to take an aggressive action. Very often, if you're preflop razor, you should be betting on 3-3-3 and 8-4-2. And in a lot of situations, you can make a very good case for betting your entire range on either of those flops, whereas this uh, bottom jack-10-9 uh, club-club-club or jack-10-9, even if it's jack-10-9 rainbow or jack-10-9 two-tone, all of those boards are going to tend to favor uh, the preflop caller. Does that mean that uh, preflop razor should never bet? Well, no, it, it doesn't mean that you should never make a continuation bet on those. I mean, you could argue for making a, a, a range check, and I think that can be a uh, viable strategy, but I think there's other viable strategies. Like, you may decide, uh, as preflop razor, you're just going to bet pocket tens, pocket jacks. Um, so let's say it's a... Uh, we'll just go in the middle of the different ones. Um, so, let's say it's two-tone. It's jack of clubs... 10 of clubs, 9 of diamonds, uh, you might decide as preflop raiser you're just going to bet uh, like pocket 10s, pocket jacks, and king queen for value, and then you're going to pick some number of bluffs, and the way to pick those bluffs on a board like that is going to be, uh, you're going to want to use the hands that have the least amount of showdown value and the highest equity when called. So, big draws, you know, uh, like the, if it's jack 10 9 2 tone then you might want to take the king queen where you've got the king of trump uh, and use that as a bluff um, you know I, I guess I'm getting kind of uh, off topic a little bit or uh, just kind of uh, well okay so you're going to want to have if you're going to have a betting range at all which is debatable um, but if you're going to have a value range at all Maybe you should bet your nutted value like jacks, tens, maybe nines, king, queen, and then a lot of your weak or uh, vulnerable hands that don't have very much showdown value, uh, but that do have decent equity when called. Uh, as preflop caller, you're going to have a lot of like mediocre hands, you're going to have some strong hands, you're going to have your two pairs, uh, some of your sets will be in your range. Um, you know, and again, this is going to come, uh, it's going to matter a lot whether it's jack of clubs, ten of clubs, nine of clubs, or if it's jack, ten, nine, rainbow, or if it's, 
you know, Jack 1092 tone. It will change the strategies and, and change the hands that you should use. Uh, but in all of those examples, this is going to be a board that's probably a little bit better for uh, pre-flop collar. Um, pre-flop collar is just not going to have a lot of air. And pre-flop collar will probably have at least the same number of uh, nutted value hands and probably have a higher distribution of uh, uh, frequent strength, <clears throat> where frequent strength might be two pair or better. You know, where you're going to have a higher concentration of 10-9, Jack-10, maybe Jack-9 suited. Um, so yeah, that's uh, those are going to be very different situations. And we're going to talk about not uh, such specific situations, but just how we arrive at uh, how we want to play our ranges in each of these spots. And then we'll revisit some more examples at the end of the video once we've already talked about, um, you know, what kind of a betting strategy we should use, okay? Uh, and these factors that we're talking about, they're, they're not only going to tell us who has incentive to bet, but they're also going to tell us um, how we ought to bet, like what kind of c-bet sizing or donk bet sizing is going to be best. Um, and uh, it's best to think of bet sizing with regard to pot size. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, and we should tend to bet smaller when we want to bet more. Like the, the more of our range that we're going to bet, the smaller those bets ought to be typically. Um, and, you know, the converse or the reverse, the opposite is also true. Uh, you know, when we bet a lot of hands, especially if we bet our entire range, we don't need to bet that much with our bluffs because if we're betting our entire range, it's because we have a massive range advantage. Um, and that's because our opponent doesn't have a tremendous amount of, like, uh, decent... Uh, hands to call us with. They won't have a lot of floats. They won't have a lot of draws. Uh, they won't have a lot of good top pairs and, and, and like second pair top kicker type stuff. So we just don't need to bet that much with our bluffs. And we can't afford to bet big with our decent value hands because we don't want to turn them into bluffs. We don't want to bet so much that like our middle strength value hands only get called when they're beat. Right? We really don't want to do that. That's a big part of what hands to bet and how big to bet them. We really don't want to waste the value of our medium strength hands. So we don't want to waste the value of our medium strong hands by making bets so big that uh, only better hands call. And conversely, if we're betting a polarized range where we're just betting our very strong hands for value and some number of bluffs uh, for balance, then our big hands benefit a lot from making big bets and getting a lot of value and our weak hands, our bluffs, benefit uh, from maximizing our fold equity. What we don't want to do is make big bets with our medium strength hands, and so that's kind of what leads you to having a polarized range on this board and in this situation, but having a uh, you know, linear range in this other situation, right? Does that mean it kind of all goes together? Um, when we bet polar, we should tend to choose bluffs that have very little showdown value so that they're going to benefit a lot from folds but if you can depending on the texture and the ranges if you can uh, pick hands that have reasonable equity when called even by the stronger parts of your opponent's range then those are the best hands to use as the bluff portion of a polarized uh, continuation betting strategy or range um, and that's you know that's primary but there are other factors that enter into the discussion. Um, and sometimes, not as often as you'd think, uh, sometimes the factors don't align perfectly, right? So it can become very difficult to find a perfect bet size and a perfect betting strategy. Uh, but that's really not the problem it could seem like uh, at first. Because um, you know, different bet sizes and your overall betting strategy... Uh, can can like different strategies, different bet sizes, different ranges, different strategies, different betting strategies at large can actually have a lot of merit when we're in a situation where the factors don't align. Um, it's very possible that since poker hasn't been solved, uh, you and I could look at two situations that are the exact same situation and one of us is going to use a big bet size 
uh, with a polarized range, and the other player wants to use more of a uh, wide, linear, and merged betting range with a smaller bet size. And usually you'll find that uh, players will have these different uh, strategies. If, well, I mean, if one player is better than the other, then, uh, but that's not what I'm really getting at. Uh, two kind of equally skilled players can have different strategies in a given situation because they're just putting more or less emphasis on one of these factors. And um, you can definitely find that um, multiple betting strategies can have about the same overall value um, as long as both players are balancing their strategies effectively. And what you'll always find will hold is that um, if, well, unless you're looking uh, at exploitative reasons, then it should always, you'll always find that the, uh, if you want to have a polarized, like a, a tight, nutted value range that you're betting for value, and then some bluffs that will uh, balance that, then you're going to be betting with a big size. And if you're going to use a linear, wide uh, value merged range, uh, then you're going to want to use a small size. Um, you know, dry static boards where you have a big range advantage and the stack to pot ratio is pretty low, uh, very often are going to call for small bets um, with a, again, with a wide range. Uh, whereas when you have a lot of draws in your range and you have, um, your opponent will have a lot, but just the board offers a lot of draws and therefore offers a lot of value targets to your uh, value bets and gives you a lot of incentive uh, to deny equity when you're pretty far ahead. Um, when you find yourself in a spot like that where um, you're going to be betting fewer hands because of the equity distributions, you know, how your opponent's range interacts with the board, how your range interacts with the board, you're going to be more polarized, you're going to value bet tighter, you're going to choose your bluffs more uh, uh, specifically, or you're going to be pickier about what kinds of hands you bluff with, um, especially with a high stack to pot ratio. All of those things are begging to use big bets. But sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation where some of these factors that you're considering are going to kind of uh, pull you in one direction, whereas some or some of the other factors are going to pull you in the other direction. In which case, the important part is just to make sure that you're thinking through things and you have a good reason to do what you're doing. You stay balanced or exploitable specifically because you know something about how your opponent makes mistakes and that you choose bigger bet sizes with polarized ranges and smaller bet sizes with linear ranges with wide ranges. Okay. Um, some other, or I guess like just to kind of recap and add, to clarify, static, when you're playing a static spot, that a static flop, it's not maybe what you think it is. It's not just a dry flop, although that's part of it. Um, just like a volatile flop is not just a wet flop, but it's part of it. Um, the, the more static the flop is, the closer the situation is to the river. So that means that you're going to find yourself in a spot where you're way ahead or way behind a lot more often. That means that the top card is going to be pretty high, and the second card even might be kind of high. Um, like Ace, Jack, Two, Rainbow is more static than Ace, Five, Four, Two Tone in a lot of ways. Um, you know, because if I'm going to bet as preflop raiser on Ace, Jack, X and Ace, Five, X. Um, if I'm betting like my entire range, which I might choose to do depending on the situation, um, what happens to second pair matters, right? Like if I'm going to bet uh, all of the pairs in between second pair and top pair, um, and there's a lot of cards in between uh, the ace as the top pair and whatever the second pair is, uh, then there is just a little bit more... Um, well, there's, there's just more ways that I can get outdrawn if I have the best hand, and there's more ways that I can make the best hand if I'm behind. So really, that's what we're talking about. I guess a way to define static would be the, the more likely 
it is that whoever has the best hand right here, right now on the flop still has the best hand at showdown, the more static the flop is. And the more volatile the flop is, the more likely it is that the person who's in the lead now does not maintain the lead throughout the hand. Um, and so for that reason, static more closely resembles the river. And that means that you should be betting strictly to get, well, fairly strictly to get called by worse or to fold out better. Whereas volatile flops play more like pre-flop. Um, there's lower cards, more connected, more suited. The hand that's best right now could easily not be best on the next street. At the turn of the card, uh, the turn card, in fact, everything could change. The equities run closer together, just like pre-flop. Um, yeah, so bet sizing typically should increase on volatile boards, and you can bet smaller on static boards. Now, it happens to be the case, too, that most of your static boards are going to be the kind of boards that favor pre-flop raiser, whereas a lot of your volatile boards are going to be the kind of boards that typically favor pre-flop caller, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's not necessarily the case. Uh, so remember that all of these things are rules of thumb. Um, all of these factors are going to give you a general idea on how to bet, like which hands, which frequencies to bet, uh, and what sizing to go for. But remember, these are just rules of thumb. They're general guidelines, and eventually, hopefully, you're going to size your bets according to your opponent's range, uh, your perceived range, uh, your actual hand, and whatever you know about your opponent's tendencies. You know, this is um, generally going to be correct to think in these terms, but if you know something very exploitable about your opponent, you don't have to stick to this, and there's no way to say that this is definitely going to be the highest EV plan to, to use these guidelines. They are that. They're guidelines. They're pretty good guidelines, and in GTO terms, they're more than guidelines. Um, but oftentimes, as I'm sure you know, you can make more money by uh, steering further away from GTO, more into an exploitative but exploitable strategy. High stack to pot ratio, use larger bet percentages, um, bet sizes uh, with regard to the pot size, uh, because implied odds and reverse implied odds are more important considerations with the higher stack to pot ratio. Uh, your single raise pots usually will offer a higher stack to pot ratio um, and more narrowly defined ranges. Um, now in a low stack to pot ratio, the small bets relative to the pot size become uh, more useful uh, because you don't have to bet as big to threaten stacks um, and you can more easily reduce the implied odds and reverse implied odds of the situation without having to make a really big bet. Hopefully you're feeling these things all kind of gel together. They really do in weird ways that are kind of unexpected or were to me until I started getting my head around it.